Coming up, they acted as judge, jury, and executioner. Vigilantes and lynch mobs who took the law into their own hands. In the rough and tumble American frontier, local citizens sometimes had to organize to protect their towns from outlaws. Their methods were often brutal. The vigilantes always found those that they put on trial guilty, and they executed within one day. They did not wait around. But in the Deep South, after the Civil War, many people filled with racial hatred used law enforcement as an excuse for mob violence and lynchings. There's 15,000 people out there waiting for vengeance. They were hollering, turn them damn niggas over to us. We know how to handle them. We're going to lynch every damn one of them. They were often depicted as heroes, guardian angels aimed at protecting the hopes and ideals of a growing nation. But behind that portrait lies an ugly truth in American history that these dispensers of extra-legal justice often became more violent than those they policed. And in the racist plague South, they wrote some of the bloodiest pages in American history. Join us for Vigilantes. December 22, 1984. Bernard Getz, a 37-year-old white man, is surrounded by four black youths demanding money in a New York subway station. A victim of a previous mugging, Getz opens fire on them. All will survive, but one is paralyzed for life. Is this a case of attempted murder or an act of self-defense? Though the shooting causes condemnation in some quarters, the press and much of the public hail Getz as a vigilante hero, someone merely acting to uphold law and order and rid the city of crime. The very word vigilante means alert watchfulness. It has traditionally been used to describe an individual or a group who takes the law into its own hands. Whether Getz is justified or not, his actions have deep roots in American history. Originally intended to protect the innocent against crime, vigilantism often gets out of hand. Vigilante gangs sweep through society in bloodthirsty pursuit of popular but illegal justice. The ideal of the vigilantes was to take the law into their own hands temporarily, and then they would disband but sometimes it didn't work out that way. Sometimes local and personal animosities developed. Sometimes the vigilantes behaved, uh, even by the standards of the vigilantes, badly. The carnage vigilantes inflict is staggering. Over 6,000 will die at their hands. Many victims are no doubt guilty of the crimes of which they are accused. Others are not. Guilty or innocent, in a land based on principles of due process, why were these extra-legal executions accepted? And why did some racially inspired lynchings take on horrifying aspects of ritualistic torture? The answers can be found in the growing veins of a young nation. South Carolina, 1767. There is a system of law enforcement throughout the colonies, but South Carolina is in the grip of unchecked crime. There was an extensive frontier area which did not have sheriffs, did not have adequate law enforcement, did not have adequate courts. And this area was beset with outlaws, and cutthroats and thieves. All of this became such a problem, the settlers protested to the authorities in Charleston, but the authorities in Charleston really didn't do anything. So the law-abiding people banded together and they called themselves regulators. Regulators is a term that will stick. It will be used to describe many vigilante groups in the coming century. 
The regulators quickly rid the area of unruly elements by banishment or lashing. But within a year of their formation, they are out of control. They begin to derive sadistic pleasure in the implementation of extra-legal justice. Some suspects are given up to 500 lashes. Others are executed for petty thefts. These people have gotten out of hand. This is the problem with vigilantism. It may, in the short term, deal with an immediate problem, such as a desperado or a group of highwaymen. But when, other in, when individuals take the law into their own hands and to enforce the law, what it tells everyone else is if, that this is okay to do. The long-term consequences of vigilantism are always destructive. To counteract the regulators, a new vigilante group known as the Moderators is formed. They attempt to break up the regulators. Pretty soon, hundreds fell in behind the uh, Moderators. And basically, there was a standoff between the two. But the regulators, actually having achieved their ends, backed off. The confrontation between South Carolina's regulators and moderators will characterize many vigilante movements in the coming years. Some will be exclusively formed to aid society in its fight against crime. Others will be less benevolent. By conservative estimate, almost 400 vigilante organizations will come into being, the vast majority of them during the nation's thrust westward. As a young America expands, crime inevitably accompanies the pioneers and the settlers. This is the Wild West of Hollywood fame. There was a tremendous amount of gambling and alcohol there were very little social constraints on these people. There was criminality, immorality, everywhere. It was a very fluid situation and a very violent situation. Although local marshals and law enforcement officers exist on the frontier, there aren't enough of them to control crime and violence. Settlers grow desperate to protect life, limb, and property. The quick solution? To form vigilante groups. Vigilantism existed simultaneous with law enforcement, alongside law enforcement. It rarely, if ever, existed in the absence of law enforcement. The vigilantes constantly argued that law enforcement was inefficient and ineffective, therefore it, they had to act. Contrary to the popular image of vigilantes as a bunch of tough guys, they are usually respectable members of the community. Out west, they are inevitably led by the frontier elite, with the middle class providing the rank and file membership. The economic elite were the people who had the greatest uh, interests that were perhaps at risk from criminals, so they would have a high motivation for leading a vigilante organization. Groups range from as few as a dozen men to hundreds. Some of the organizations are short-lived, others last for months. But they all have loyal members who are able to spring into action quickly. Once culprits are rounded up, the vigilantes ignore the established judiciary systems and set up their own ad hoc courts. A typical case occurs in northern Illinois in 1841. There, vigilantes, once again calling themselves regulators, accuse two men of horse theft and murder. A regulator serves as judge, Two others are appointed as lawyers, one to represent the accused, the other as prosecutor. The trial lasts but a few hours. The prosecuting attorney urges execution. After being spared an hour for prayer, the two men are lynched by hanging. Lynching will define vigilante punishment well into the 20th century. While most people today associate lynching with death by hanging, it originally implied punishment by various means. The meaning of the word lynching comes from one Colonel Charles Lynch, an outspoken anti-British patriot during the Revolutionary period. He led a movement, a local movement, in southern Virginia against Tories, some of whom were behaving like thugs and outlaws and uh, subjected them to summary punishment, meaning whipping. 
that practice became associated with the name of Colonel Charles Lynch. As the years pass and the country is settled, lynching will eventually mean death, usually by hanging. By the turn of the 19th century, vigilante groups have sprung up in all regions of the country. But it is in California that the largest and most influential of all vigilante groups will thrive. In 1848, gold is discovered in California. Within weeks, thousands of people are streaming into the West. In less than 12 months, the sleepy seaside port of San Francisco swells from a few hundred people to nearly 5,000, and the fortune seekers keep coming. In 1851, San Francisco had become a rather bustling town of about 50,000, filled with all manner of individuals. Because of its frontier qualities and the fact that it had been Mexican territory up until a few years before, there was a, a tenuous relationship between stability and law and then outright disorder. It's basically young street people stealing things and then committing robberies and other businesses and things. A vigilante committee was developed that year. Known as the Vigilance Committee, the group quickly eradicates crime and disbands after 60 days. By 1855, the California gold fields are about panned out. In a 10-month period, disappointment and tension lead to 489 murders, an average of more than one a day. The law manages to track down and execute only six of the offenders. Violent crime is only one of San Francisco's problems. It is now one of the largest cities in the nation. With this growth has come political corruption. It goes unchecked until a young journalist from the East with the colorful name of James King of William begins to investigate city politics. He had a natural flair for journalism. He founded the San Francisco Daily Bulletin and very quickly he made it one of the crusading newspapers in San Francisco. King uses the Daily Bulletin to expose stuffed ballot boxes and the pilfering of public funds that have corrupted city politics under the leadership of Councilman David Broderick. He controlled San Francisco city government through a great deal of election fraud, and bribery, and violence, and that sort of thing. And the merchants in San Francisco got worried that with those sorts of conditions, moneyed people in the East were going to be more reluctant to lend money to merchants in San Francisco. As King digs deeper, he learns something that puts his life in danger. He discovers that one of David Broderick's political cronies is an ex-inmate of Sing Sing Prison in New York by the name of James Casey. King threatens to expose Casey's criminal past. When James Casey got wind, that James King of William was going to publish his Sing Sing record, he threatened King and in effect said, you do that and I will kill you. The crusading editor refuses to back down and on May 14, 1856, James King falls victim to Casey's threat. Seriously injured, he is hospitalized where he lies close to death. The shooting incites members of the 1851 Vigilance Committee to reform in a new vigilante group. Led by William T. Coleman and other businessmen in the city, the Vigilance Committee's immediate goal is to combat Broderick, his henchmen, and especially to bring James Casey to justice. But the 1856 Committee of Vigilance would be unlike any vigilante group before or after. It would quickly grow into the largest extra-legal anti-crime organization in American history. Within days, 3,500 new members join its ranks. It would eventually comprise as many as 8,000, all fully armed. These men are highly disciplined and superbly organized. 
All of them swear allegiance to the group, are bound by constitutional bylaws, and are required to carry official membership cards. They were very careful and systematic about their organization. They had very careful bylaws outlining who could join out a criminal record. You couldn't have a record of alcoholism, gambling. They had to sign a pledge of conduct. They were drilled in military fashion. And it was a very rigidly controlled organization. It's generally cited uh, as the quintessential vigilante group. The Vigilance Committee apprehends its target, Casey, and another criminal. They are held captive at the committee's headquarters. Fearing an outbreak of violence, law enforcement does not intervene. On May 20th, six days after he was shot, James King dies. That same day, the Vigilance Committee provides Casey with an attorney to plead his case, and a public trial begins. Meanwhile, the Vigilance Committee constructs a makeshift gallows in the city plaza. In the early hours of Wednesday, May 21st, Casey is found guilty of murder and sentenced to immediately hang. In the aftermath of the Casey execution, crime in San Francisco drops dramatically and remains low for decades. Clearly, the message has been effective. Watch out, or you will be next. The Vigilance Committee of 1856 uh, disbanded uh, towards the end of the summer. They had accomplished by that time what they wanted to accomplish. They wanted to get back to normal. By the end of 1856, the largest vigilante movement in history has come and gone in San Francisco. But in 1863, gold is discovered in Montana. There, one of the deadliest vigilante groups of all will come into being. A region rich in the precious metal called Alder Gulch spawns two large towns, Virginia City and Nevada City. Within months of the discovery, 30,000 fortune seekers descend on the area. It is soon the largest outpost of civilization between Minneapolis and San Francisco. The towns take on the trappings of any large American metropolitan area, with stores, schools, and saloons. There is so much gold around that it becomes the local form of currency. That was the medium exchange. That's just a pinch of uh, gold dust was the price of a drink, and bartenders would cultivate long fingernails so they could increase the amount of gold they could get out in a pinch. But with gold comes danger. Criminals of all sorts prey upon the people of the area. The most notorious gang is the so-called road agents, composed of men willing to kill for gold. The secret leader of the road agents is Henry Plummer, who controls the gang with an iron fist. Plummer is an ex-convict, and he is also sheriff of the nearby town of Bannock. Well, Plummer was only about 26 years old himself. Like any gold rush of that type, there were an awful lot of young men. There were some members of the Plummer band who were even younger than Plummer. In a way, it functioned like a juvenile gang. In an eight-month reign of terror, Plummer's gang murders 112 prospectors and travelers, robbing them of millions of dollars worth of gold. Because Plummer is sheriff, his men are never caught. One bloodthirsty member of the gang is a particularly unsavory character. One of these guys was the worst, probably, Boone Helm, uh, who uh, was a cannibal, uh, took delight in uh, killing his victims and cutting off their more edible body parts and roasting them for dinner. In the face of this savage violence, the citizens of Virginia City, Nevada City, and Bannock decide to fight back. In December of 1863, they form a vigilante group to bring the gang to justice. Under the leadership of Virginia City livery owner James Williams, the vigilantes secretly infiltrate the road agents. They soon discover that Sheriff Plummer and his two deputies, Ned Ray and Buck Stinson, are the masterminds of the gang. 
In the late afternoon of January 9th, 1864, the vigilantes close in. As Plummer makes his way home, he senses something is wrong. He hurries along, but it is too late. Get out there. Plummer and his accomplices Ray and Stinson are captured and taken to the gallows erected by Plummer himself for hanging his own victims. Ned Ray is the first to hang. Buck Stinson is next. Because they are hoisted up and not dropped, the men strangle to death. When it is Plummer's turn to die, he begs that the men drop him, thus avoiding the horrors of strangulation. The vigilantes oblige. With Plummer and his lieutenants dead, Bannock, Virginia City, Alder Gulch, and Nevada City are freed from the worst of the road agents. The vigilantes here accomplished a, a wonderful purpose and have been considered to be heroes in the Virginia City country and Montana in general ever since. After the vigilante activity, uh, it's said you could leave a pan of gold dust on the street overnight and nobody would touch it. Though Henry Plummer and his gang are gone, it will be another 14 years before southern Montana is purged of all criminal elements. The same vigilante group that hanged the road agents now adopts a new tactic to scare thieves and murderers away. Every time a robber's hideout is discovered, the vigilantes leave a calling card before taking action. Scrawled in axle grease on walls or painted neatly on the signboards of buildings, the message is simple. It contains no words, only the numbers 3, 7, and 77. It meant that you would be uh, if you found that on your door, you had better leave town in three hours, seven minutes, and 77 seconds, or you'd be buried in a grave three feet wide, seven feet long, and 77 inches deep. That, in truth, is what had better happen if you found that on your door. Uh, you had a brief time to get out of town, or you'd be buried. In two years, the vigilantes hang 30 criminals in Virginia City. As so often happens, good vigilantism, or what can perhaps more aptly be termed socially constructive vigilantism, has its adverse side effects. Socially constructive vigilantism may, in fact, have rid a local society of a murderer or of a group of desperados. But because, in the short term, it encourages people to take the law in their own hands, it encourages violent self-assertion, in the long term, the same thing, it, it leads to a disrespect for the law, it, it leads to a, uh, an arbitrariness about the law, and has been ultimately very, uh, very destabilizing to American society. By the 1890s, vigilantism in the West is a thing of the past. I believe that the one single factor that led to the demise of vigilantism in the West was the railroads. It facilitated the economic development of the, of the West. As families moved into the West, Western towns and states began to adopt laws that cut down on general outlawry, and there goes your need for vigilance committees. By the beginning of the 20th century, frontier vigilantism has come to an end with the widespread establishment of effective law enforcement agencies. But a more sinister type of vigilante activity continues to survive neo-vigilantism. Neo-vigilantism is a phenomenon of post-Civil War America. The big difference between old and new, if you will, vigilantism, is that old vigilantism focused on criminality, violent crime. New vigilantism tended to focus on undesirable people to create a strict racial, ethnic, and at times religious hierarchy. The old vigilantism was about repressing crime. New vigilantism was about repressing people. Neo-vigilantism's targets are Catholics, Jews, immigrants, and especially blacks. The numbers of African-American citizens killed are staggering. 
Contemporary scholars are constantly revising the figures of the number lynched in the Deep South. Many believe that in the decades between the 1880s and the 1930s, more than 5,000 people died brutal deaths. At its height, during the 1890s, lynchings will claim the life of a black person every day and a half. The frenzy of racial lynchings begins in the wake of one of the most tempestuous periods in our nation's history. Born of the ashes of the Civil War, neo-vigilantism is a response to the complex social problems of an emerging new society. After slaves are freed, many blacks take advantage of the free enterprise system in commerce and agriculture to the distress of many Southern whites. The freed black for whites is a very complicated and, and very difficult issue. Um, these uh, uh, bodies are no longer commodities now. Now they're free. The freedom of slaves sort of represents the, ch the complete change uh, in the society, a change that many Southerners didn't want. The, the whites wanted to maintain a society in which they were dominant and in which they had all sorts of privileges and rights and uh, they wanted to keep as much of the dominant position that they had had while slavery existed. Unlike the highly organized regulators and long-lasting committees of vigilance in the West, Southern lynch mobs are spontaneous. They last only as long as it takes to hunt down and beat or kill their victims. There are no oaths of allegiance, rules of conduct, or formalities. But they do claim to have just cause for their deadly actions. Victims are always accused of committing a crime. The most common charge is murder or non-sexual assaults, but second on the list is the allegation of sexual misconduct against white women. There's a tremendous amount of sexual tension that begins to envelop the Southern society. The thing that's driving this lynching is this kind of idea of the black rapist, that, uh, that the rationale for lynching is that um, uh, black men are raping uh, white women. Reflecting the tacit approval of the extra-legal control of blacks by much of Southern white society, the judicial system, politicians, and the national press ignore the plight of blacks in the South. But in the midst of ever-growing racial lynchings in the late 1800s, there are some voices of dissent. Frederick Douglass, a freed black slave, is the first to speak out against lynching. Less well-known is Ida B. Wells, who in 1892 becomes part owner of the Memphis Free Speech newspaper in Tennessee. She publicizes the vicious treatment of blacks in the Deep South. Ida B. Wells launched her crusade against lynching. She wrote about it in editorials in the Memphis Free Speech at Headlight, her newspaper. She was touring, speaking about lynching, when her newspaper was in fact burned down and she was told never to come back to Memphis again. Undeterred, Ida B. Wells takes her anti-lynching campaign to New York and even abroad. One of the key moments in the lynching campaign in Ida B. Wells' life was when she was invited uh, to England to bring the campaign there. What she's able to do is to convince the English that indeed there's something going wrong uh, in the South. Many newspaper reporters begin uh, to write about anti-lynching, begin to ask questions about what is going on in the United States. Anti-lynching crusades do little to slow the onslaught of killings at the end of the 19th century. In fact, the executions become more frequent and more violent, some taking on aspects of ritualistic torture. One of the most sadistic incidents takes place in Newman, Georgia in 1899. Sam Holt, a black man, is accused of murdering a white farmer and then raping his wife. A newspaper account vividly describes Holt's lynching. Before the torch was applied to the pyre, the Negro was deprived of his ears, fingers, and other portions of his body with surprising fortitude. Before the body was cool, it was cut into pieces. The Negro's heart was cut into several pieces, as was his liver. 
Small pieces of bone went for 25 cents, and a bit of liver crisply cooked for 10 cents. I think one of the aspects of anti-black vigilante violence in the South that still baffles students of the subject is mob psychology. In other words, it's one thing to understand why they painted African-American men as black beasts. It's another thing to then understand why they executed them by castrating them, burning them alive, or ripping them apart in mobs. And that side of mob psychology, I think, is still almost inexplicable. Because much of Southern white society still condones a belief in racial superiority, the law is invariably on the side of the lynchers. Southern law enforcement officers often ignore the killings and sometimes even participate in them. But by the turn of the century, the lynchings are so frequent, the nation finally begins to take notice. This follows decades of indifference by Washington. The federal government turned a blind eye to lynching in the South because it was not universally recognized that lynching was a problem, because the Democratic Party was dominated by Southern senators and congressmen who effectively kept their party out of involvement. A milestone is reached in 1909 when the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People is founded in New York City. It becomes a vocal force in the anti-lynching campaign. The group maintains a running tally of victims and lobbies Congress for anti-lynching laws. Although their pleas fall on politically deaf ears, the NAACP and other anti-lynching organizations refuse to allow the nation to ignore the problem and the protests continue. Whenever a lynching occurs, a flag of mourning is flown from the office window of the NAACP, announcing the atrocity to the world. While black men are the overwhelming targets of the majority of Southern lynchings, some acts of popular justice reflect intolerance of a different kind. The early 20th century is a time of great tension in the South. Economic woes and dreadful working conditions plague the region. Resettled northern factory owners exploit the southern workforce. This, combined with anxiety about the waves of immigrants pouring into the country, add to the rash of virulent racial and religious prejudice gripping the South. It is in this atmosphere that one of the most publicized lynchings in history takes place. Atlanta, Georgia, April 27, 1913. The charred body of 13-year-old Mary Fagan is discovered in a pencil factory where she worked. Police focus their suspicions on a married 29-year-old superintendent at the factory. Leo Frank is the perfect suspect. He is wealthy, a northerner, and Jewish. Anti-Jewish sentiments flare up in the local press and community. Crowds taunt jurors as they walk into the courtroom every morning yelling, hang the Jew or we'll hang you. Though the evidence against Frank is full of holes, a jury convicts him of the murder. He is sentenced to death. Convinced of Frank's innocence, Georgia Governor John Slayton commutes the death sentence to life in prison, saying, I would be a murderer if I allowed this man to hang. Ironically, a hanging is exactly what happens. A mob calling themselves the Knights of Mary Fagan storms the jail where Frank is held, kidnaps him, and takes him to the woods. He is asked to confess to the crime. He refuses. Leo Frank is hanged on the spot. The lynching of Leo Frank was a scandal, an international scandal. It was one of the most notorious lynchings and certainly one of the most notorious examples of anti-Semitism in American history. Unlike the Leo Frank saga, few black lynchings attract the national press. However, they often do become a sordid form of public spectacle, drawing huge crowds which seem to take pleasure in watching a man slowly writhe in agony until death claims him. Lynchings broke the monotony 
of the agricultural life. Sad fact was that people, many people, viewed this uh, lynching as entertainment. They would take a picnic lunch on those occasions when there was prior knowledge of the lynching, and they would attend it, and they treated them as festive occasions. The 1919 extra-legal killing of confessed murderer Jesse Washington illustrates this carnival atmosphere. A mob of 15,000 onlookers cheer as the 18-year-old black youth is tortured and slowly burned to death. But by the end of the 1920s, a variety of factors result in a declining number of lynching incidents. Blacks flee the South to escape prejudice and economic hardship. Condemnation from the Southern press increases, and law enforcement turns less of a blind eye to the killings. As a new decade dawns, the chilling experience of a teenager demonstrates the horror of the black plight, but also indicates a social change looming on the horizon. It's 1930 in Marion, Indiana. On a warm summer evening, 16-year-old James Cameron and two friends decide to rob a couple on a lonely stretch of road. But as Cameron approaches them, he gets scared and backs out of the crime. I gave the gun back to one of my Confederates, and I said, here, you guys take this. I'm not going to have anything to do with this. And I ran away, and I'd gone about two or three blocks when I heard those shots. Bang, bang, bang. Cameron's friends, Thomas Shipp and Abram Smith, have killed the man. Because Cameron was seen with the culprits earlier, he is implicated in the crime. Just after midnight, he is captured by the police and arrested. Uh, they uh, took me over to the jail, put me on the second floor. And I didn't know it, but they'd already arrested Tommy and Abe. They had Tommy down on the first floor right below me. Outside the jailhouse, an angry mob gathers, hungry for revenge. And there's 15,000 people out there waiting for vengeance. And they were hollering, turn them damn niggas over to us. We know how to handle them. We're going to lynch every damn one of them. And they were cussing us out and going on something terrible. The mob bursts through the door of the jailhouse and grabs Thomas' ship first. And then about 15 or 20 minutes later, after killing Tommy, they came back and they got Abe out and they beat him to death and they took him and drug him up to the streets like a dead horse. And then they came back and got me. Cameron is beaten and dragged to a tree where the lifeless bodies of his two friends hang. And I pleaded with people to help me that I hadn't done nothing to deserve this kind of treatment and nothing happened. They put the rope around my neck and then they throw the other end of the rope over the limb of the tree, and they were getting ready to draw me up. As the frenzied mob screams for blood, Cameron prepares to die. And I prayed to God. I said, Lord, have mercy and forgive me my sins. They would hit me with everything. Pick handles, shovels, fists, kids spitting on me and everything. And uh, when I said, Lord, have mercy and forgive me my sins, Everything got deathly quiet because a voice came out from heaven. It had to be from heaven, because I don't see how in the world a human voice could have stilled the fury and anger of the mob that night. That voice said, take this boy back. He had nothing to do with any killing or raping. And you know what? Those hands that had already killed two human beings, they became soft and kind and tender. And they took that rope off my neck and they allowed me to stumble and stagger a half a block back to the jail. For reasons never fully understood, the mob spares Cameron's life. He spends more than four years in prison and is finally released on parole. The dramatic story of James Cameron provides a closing chapter to the 50-year era of racially inspired lynching frenzy. While prejudices will remain strong in the South for years to come, and sporadic lynchings will continue to scar the region, broad acceptance of public killing wanes. However, the end of the lynching era does not mean an end to violence or intolerance. It's just a lot of thrill killing going on in this country. Not only among 
uh, blacks and whites, uh, well, whites doing it to blacks, but also blacks doing it to blacks and whites doing it to whites too. It seems to be a, a legacy that we have in this country and nothing but violence to attain what we want. Recent FBI statistics reveal that while serious crime has decreased nationally, hate crimes, today's vigilantism, are once again on the rise. Race-related assaults top the list, but a significant number of the attacks are based on the victim's religion or sexual orientation. And some officials believe the problem is worse than it appears because many victims, fearful of retribution, do not report such crimes to the police. I'm Arthur Kent for the History Channel. Thanks for watching. To discover more about this and other History's Mysteries topics, please visit our website at historychannel.com.